And we are live in Stanford. Hi, gentlemen. It's Jim Joy. Hey, Jim. Can you Hi. hear us? Very well. Hello, Jim. Hey, Jason. Thank you. It's a great panel. Uh, Nick, I hope you've got something to say here. I, unfortunately, it's not going to be anything terrible cerebrovascular, but we have a very interesting case. But first, I want to introduce the operators, staff, uh, radiographers, and nurses. To my right, Jason Lee uh, from the Division of Vascular Surgery, Tiffany Wu, a vascular surgery fellow, and in the room helping us are Tom Brennan, Edmund Goh, Eric DeLong, Kim Reed, Claudia Harrison, and Scott Rivas. And our anesthesiologist behind us is Chris Mora. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jason, and he's going to give you the uh, nuts and bolts of our case. We've done a little preliminary work, and uh, we'll go over that as soon as Jason's done with the preliminaries. Okay, welcome panel. Um, so if we could have the slides up. Today's uh, first case is going over distal, distal TVAR landing zones. If I could have the next slide. So this is a 77-year-old female who had a history of an ascending aortic aneurysm and valve repair this past year. Now in follow-up, uh, found to have a six centimeter thoracic aortic aneurysm. Currently asymptomatic with all the usual past medical history and medications, still smoking half a pack per day. Next slide. On exam, really uh, uh, presented electively to our clinic. Labs are all uh, normal. Creatinine is normal at 0 0.9 with a GFR of greater than 60. Next slide. So as we run through some imaging here, this is the, this is the proximal descending thoracic aorta in maximal measurement here, uh, measuring 63 by 56, and on uh, the uh, uh, sagittal MIP, measuring about 68 millimeters. Uh, lots of mural thrombus that's on the outer wall there, as you can see. Next slide. As we, uh, this is the 3D reconstruction. Uh, the arch uh, is uh, uh, fairly unfavorable at the region of the subclavian. Um, and uh, there's about uh, 15 millimeters from that carotid to the subclavian. Um, next slide. Uh, distally uh, becomes even more challenging down close to where the um, visceral vessels come through, and I'll show you some measurements on the next slide. So up at the arch there between uh, the um, left, left carotid and left subclavian measures about 38 millimeters just past the left subclavian, about 36 millimeters, and really uh, about 15 millimeters later uh, balloons out to 41. Uh, distally, what you see there in the yellow marks is the uh, celiac marked off and the SMA marked off. We have actually about two centimeters between the, uh, between the origin of the celiac and the origin of the SMA. Below the SMA there measures about 24, 29 in between the visceral vessels, and then right above the celiac, 32, and within 15 millimeters, 37. So really what we uh, wanted to ask, I guess, to start, to start off the panel with was what they thought of the landing zones and what the, what the various strategies might be. All right. So Jim, so. in the future, obviously, the arch may be a candidate for a side branch device. Uh, obviously, we don't have that now in this particular anatomy is outside of the protocol we're currently enrolling in. But given the challenges now in these sort of non-favorable, both proximal and distal, uh, we just wanted to hear what the thoughts were from the group that you've got assembled, and then we'll tell you what we're up to. All right, so I'm going to start on my far left and ask uh, Barry to... Well, yeah, hi, on. gentlemen. Uh, what, a, what a challenging case, actually. Um, so when, one of the things we've seen when we have very large diameter proximal and distal landing zones was the, uh, the issue of sealing and the challenges in sealing. Um, it looks like there's enough room distal to the left subclavian uh, to land a device without, without uh, um, sort of uh, side branching the subclavian. I don't know what your plans are going to be or what you've already done. Um, and, uh, but it looks like there's probably enough room um, depending on what device you select. And, I think the distal landing zone is also a challenge, and uh, uh, we'd probably put some sort of a marker or something in there to make sure we could actually uh, identify the celiac artery, leave a catheter in it, something like that, so we, we don't exclude the celiac. Joe, you want to comment? Hi, guys. Joe Lombardi. Um, yeah, looking, Hi, I agree with Hi, uh, Barry's comments without reiterating that, but some, sometimes we look at aneurysms like this and we'll contemplate a hybrid approach where we're landing a, uh, a uh, thoracic graft, bringing it down close to the celiac, and then do a, a very limited repair. And this looks like it's set up nicely for that. It's more like a type 5. 
Uh, so it's probably, it's probably something I'd consider for this case. So I, I guess the question that I would okay. add to the mix, Mike, is uh, just how far distal you think you need to go. And obviously the more real estate that we take up with a graft, the greater the risk we're going to have of spinal issues. And uh, you know, try, trying to make this as simple as you can, it may not be possible, but I wonder if you couldn't get away with sparing the left subclaving, uh, parking it, uh, you know, five centimeters or so from the celiac with a provisional strategy. If you're not able to get seal, obviously you can extend proximally while putting a snorkel in the, in the subclavian, um, maybe a periscope down, if you will. Yeah. All the good comments. Thanks, Jim, Barry, Joe. Can we go back one slide? I think uh, back another. Uh, this is sort of a, obviously a reverse taper neck, just proximal, or just distal to the left subclavian, and we were a little intimidated by that. And given her sort of diffuse degenerative disease pattern, as Jason mentioned, she's already had her ascending repaired. Uh, we thought we might have to extend beyond that, but your thoughts about doing it sort of in a in a staged way or sort of an extension way are very good. I can tell you uh, we've got another plan, and Jason can tell us what was done for this patient starting yesterday. So um, we decided proximally, uh, um, uh, based on some of the comments uh, made already, that we thought that uh, the neck with the reverse taper probably wouldn't sit that well. And since we since we gain an additional 15 to 20 millimeters there going right up to the left carotid, uh, we um, yesterday performed a carotid subclavian bypass um, and um, have already plugged then the origin of the subclavian. And so, you know, I think that buys us uh, two centimeters of more confident uh, uh, neck seal proximally without having to worry about that top part. And we definitely think that revascularizing the subclavian electively in somebody who's, you know, obviously had uh, multiple aortic aneurysmal disease over the years is a safe thing to do for all issues related to, to, to spinal cord and posterior circulation. Okay. Right. Uh, what, we're going to show you some other pictures here. And Kim, can you go... Uh, and first off, show us the, uh, let's go through the axials, Kim. You're right there. This is right at the celiac, and you can see that's a generous aorta, I think everyone would admit. Let's go down, a, yeah, there's the celiac. So that's, that's pretty big there, and uh, not fully cylindrical, and so uh, we have a plan to deal with that uh, celiac. Uh, go down a little more, Kim. I think you're going up. That's going up. So you guys see there's, there's really only four or five clicks before you really are getting into thrombus that's above the celiac. So I think that that landing zone is right on the margin of almost not there. Yeah, so the once we get here, we're kind of more confident. And let's then go to the uh, uh, Leonardo and look at the uh, 3D reconstructions. Uh, this is a uh, uh, LAO about 30 degrees. Uh, actually, this is the... This is an RAO. Excuse me, let's go to LAO. Let's go to the RAO, please. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and so what we've sort of looked at here, and, and you're sort of getting the idea of what the uh, distal landing zone challenge is. We're going to try and land the graft uh, just above the SMA. And to do that, we're going to periscope the celiac. Uh, that periscope will go down to, uh, let's see, the uh, uh, REO, please. Uh, excuse me, LAO. I'm confusing you, Kim, sorry. There. So you can see the left renal there. And that left renal is where we'll end the periscope, just below the SMA. Uh, and let's go to the arch now. And he'll give you another view of the arch. Yeah. And I think. Uh, this is about a 30 degree, uh, 35 degree LAO, 10 cranial. We sort of think this is the best view, and, and it's conceivable, you guys might be right, we might have been able to get a seal distal to the subclavian, but it does sort of, clearly you can see the walls aren't parallel. Uh, well, well so seeing those, we axials, are those axials are uh, much different than what we saw in the, uh, the recon, so I, you can see there, there actually isn't much of a neck. Uh, you know, uh, on, on those axials. Yeah. I, I guess one question I have is when, when you're doing these kinds of things, do you do, you do anything uh, to assess uh, collateral flow before you 
uh, before you periscope? In other words, uh, do you ever consider just covering it and or occluding the celiac um, versus periscoping it or essentially contingency in the event the periscope fails uh, to, to assess blood flow as to whether you might need to do a uh, debranching or something or, or bypass? Great, great question. Great question, Barry. And, and we do intentionally occlude uh, uh, proximal celiacs with plugs if, uh, if it's, we think that's going to get in the way or be too troublesome, especially when we're going more distal with branches and to do a, a total branch solution. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's necessary, we think, to, to get to be successful to actually take the celiac out of play. We tend not to do any diagnostic maneuvers to look at collateral flow to the celiac and uh, its sufficiency or not. Uh, oftentimes, we're looking at suitability. In this case, uh, we elected to try and preserve, and obviously, as you're well aware, these parallel graphs, the chimps that have been talked about all week in, at Viva and many different uh, venues and sessions, uh, have some downsides as well, obviously the gutters, and we're going to address that today as well. So let me explain to you sort of where we are, and we have, I think, uh, a plan. Uh, it may not uh, be the best plan, but it's our plan. On the right groin here, uh, the vascular surgery team led by Dr. Lee have cut down on the femoral artery. We have a 24 French sheath, and that's going to be necessary to require the diameter size that we need, which is distal 40, proximal 45, for a thoracic endograft. In the left groin, we have a 14 French sheath, again, done to, during a cut down. As Jason mentioned, mentioned uh, the left subclavian has been plugged. The patient has a lumbar catheter for CSF drainage. Uh, that's all set. And in this Gore dry seal sheath, we have two catheters. One is the tour guide uh, made by Oscar, distributed by Terumo, as you know. That's one of uh, a number of deflectible sheaths or steerable sheaths, as they call. This is a seven French with a 17 millimeter arc. Uh, they also have make it in nine millimeter arcs. We've chosen the 17. And to go through this 14, we have a four French pigtail. Uh, let's go to the last run, Kim, and show them. So I'm doing this in biplane, and you'll see why that may have some advantage. Uh, obviously, Barry and others know that Traditionally, we don't take advantage of biplane. Uh, it often has, uh, you know, it's not quite as user friendly. But can you see both the A and B planes here, guys? Yeah, yeah. Yep, we're good. For you guys. And yeah, Jason can run it. So, uh, what we did is obviously to map out in these different angles. We've got about a 40 degree RAO on the B plane and a 40 degree LAO on the A plane. We have placed the Oscar or the uh, tour guide, seven French, into the celiac. Uh, that was done almost without much trouble at all. And then we wired out the splenic and have uh, our periscope, which in this case is a Viabon six millimeter by five centimeter long. It's not in perfect position yet, but we've got it in, the, in a location where it's, it's comfortable and it's relatively secure. And then we've placed up through the uh, right groin uh, the 24 French sheath, and outside here you can see a Gore C tag measuring 40 millimeters by 20 centimeters long. And we also have, have done images up higher to look at the arch. This C tag is on a double curve Lunderquist, which is in the ascending right now. And we're going to go ahead now and advance the C tag up in position, do some more imaging. Again, the goal here, and we'd love to hear your comments, is to take the bottom of the C tag to the top of the SMA. And again, because the shortest biobon we have is five, we don't want to be across, obviously, a splenic or a paddock branch. We're going to bring the bottom of the periscope down to just the uh, upper ostium of the left renal. So that's the plan. And uh, give us your thoughts, and we'll just start working here. All right, Michael. Well, while, while you guys are working, we'll uh, recap that strategy and see if there are any alternatives that, that might be offered. Um, Tony, I don't want to ignore you over here. Please do. This is, like, I, like Nick Hopkins said, way out of my pay grade. Um, it is interesting, though, that uh, we are the uh, passive recipients of patients like this after um, thoracic uh, repair. And I uh, just recently had a referral for a patient who had a carotid subclavian bypass, had a thoracic graft placed, and now the patient's uh, carotid subclavian bypass has gone down. 
how do we out in uh, practice when we are faced with the complications of these or the, the follow-up of these deal with those kind of things? What, what would you advise for that? Well, I'd certainly want to know how far away the originator of the work was. So the run, Kim. <laughs> Let's see if they can. 2,000 miles. Yeah, 2,000. Okay, so that's a we're all far. hooked up. So we'll go 12. Well, if, if, they're, uh, if they indeed covered and plugged and the graft is down and they're asymptomatic, I mean, there are a number of these T-bar cases that, that are done where the left subclavian is simply sacrificed. And you know, with an intact circle, we'll have said, you know, surprisingly, will be tolerated. I personally don't like to rely on a circle of Willis that's going to go into play only on demand. I'd rather, you know, because, because we can snorkel these with relative ease, uh, I usually protect at all costs. Um, Joe, when you look at this, uh, you know, we're not there, we're not seeing their images. We haven't had the chance to scroll through them, you know, in the, in the detail that we might like. That is, uh, would you go after both mesenterics in this particular case? No, we've, uh, we've covered the celiac and plugged it with uh, pretty good success. And uh, most of okay. these situations, it's, ready, it's pretty well re, uh, collateralized. Ready, so, good. so I'd probably go after the one in this situation. Okay. Barry, with uh, already an ascending repair, and now we're going to graft from the aorta just beyond the left common all the way down to the renal access. Um, what would, you, what would you quote this patient in terms of likelihood well, of spinal problems? Um, we would definitely use uh, 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 spinal drainage uh, to start with. Um, we'd probably quote this patient at 6 to 8% okay uh, risk of paraplegia. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a little bit higher, but that's, that's probably, I think, reasonable enough to scare somebody uh, uh, and make sure they know that it's a significant risk. Um, just got to go up a little it, bit. It's, yeah. You know, Mike's mentioned a couple of things because really the degenerative change in, is very diffuse and throughout this aorta. And so there's really not a clearly defined neck like really on either that? side. And so you want to bring um, a the risk of gutter leaks, as he mentioned, is, is a potential okay. issue. And Mike, if you're ready to talk, I'm, I'm going to back okay, off of this comment. Barry, we just are doing some fine tuning. We did a run. Kim, can you show the last run just to one more time for us? I got it. Okay, we got it here. <laughs> We're just trying to get as close to that top of that SMA. Can you guys see that in that lateral plane on the B plane one there? So the B plane is the, obviously our, our plane to look at the celiac and the SMA, and the A plane is the renals, and we think we're in pretty good position. We'll do another confirmatory run, and then the plan will be that with the uh, uh, Biobond still within the uh, tour guide sheath, we will deploy the CTAG. That again should be targeted at the upper ostium of the SMA. Then we'll do the same and sort of take care of the, uh, uh, the okay. Biobond in the let's, celiac. Let's so let's on. do one more run. Let's get okay. armed again. Yep. So, Mike, if I'm understanding you okay, correctly, you then you're going to deploy guys? the CTAG first and the Biobond second. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All ready? Okay. Apnea, please. Joe, is that the Jim, sequence that you would use? Different combinations. Joe? Yeah, Jim, we've done it in would all you, different uh, sequences. Would you deploy the CTAG first or the Viabonds first in this, in this setting? No, I, I like their sequence. I, I, I'm partial to their, their approach to this. Uh -huh. so it looks like to make it safe and, and able to get in there, too, they have sheaths that are across part of them, so they're going to... Yeah. Boys still have sheath mm -hmm. just over the Viabon. Yeah, I just I worry a little bit about the exoskeleton of the Viabon catching well, on the exoskeleton of the, of the graft. I think that's good there. Yeah. The sequence of these uh, chimneys and periscopes might vary uh, depending on whether you're using balloon expandable uh, or self-expanding devices and whether you're coming from below or above. So mm -hmm. I think in this particular case, uh, because of the variables that they're trying to call, uh, um, control and the and and the certain a little bit of uncertainty about where the distal end of an endograph winds up versus the proximal yeah. that it probably uh, makes a lot of sense to do it this way all right mike okay, where so are we're you we're going to get our pigtail out and then we're going to go ahead and uh, do this 
Okay. okay. I think we came off. down a little, come right? Come off, Laura. Let me just look at this one more time. We're going to look at this just one more time of the old run. Yeah, obviously, we don't want to cover the renals. Let's see that? Okay. Okay. I yeah. think we need to see for you. So these yeah. tend to rise up, not come down. For those of you who are not familiar with the tax, uh, yeah. uh, if they're going to move at all. That, um, that's safe. That's going to pop Because off. of the tortuosity of the yeah. thoracic aorta, it's going to eat up some length. You guys like that there? Okay. Here we go, guys. Pull down. This will expand center to pull down. distal. Oh, that's right on. Looks so right looks good. Looks on the mark. It doesn't uh, look like it moved a bit. No, okay. It didn't. Good. Okay, so now we'll go after and uh, we'll uh, fine tune our uh, our uh, Viabon in the tour guide. And let's go ahead. You want me to put? Uh, do you want? Should we do one more run just to make sure, or just Better. know that we're going to be? Let's let's do the uh, play that last run uh, that we had, Kim. I got it. I got it, Kim. Okay. So this was the last run. You can see the celiac, so or the, the, renal, the SMA. Is way down. It's kind of in the middle of where that colon contrast outline so, is. So guys, the main, uh, yeah, the renal collecting system. So we'll go ahead and look at this uh, by pulling down, because I don't want to cover, obviously, any branches of the celiac. So let's go ahead and, and uh, uh, come down. Should I go ahead and pull back the uh, tour guide? Okay, why don't you pin pull that and I'll hold this in position. So, the so what we're going to do is pin back the, the tour guide and you can maybe take some of the curve out of that thing. So really important to when you're working in a vacuous aorta like this to have that kind of support from, for the Viabon. If you just ran it up there and it was kind of floating freely in the breeze, you pull the string and it can end up in a lot of places that you didn't intend it. I think that's going you know, to be good there. Jason and Mike are doing a really good job of communicating here. I mean, one of the things that I see that ends up getting people into trouble is when things are getting a little hairier, things get quiet in the lab, and that's when you got to kind of prompt yourself to talk a little bit more. So these little manip manipulations that they're doing, they're doing a great job of talking back and forth to make sure that both sets of hands know what the other are doing. Okay. Jim, help us with the uh, choice of the length of the Vibon to try to make sure that this periscope comes out far enough. Let's say the SeaTac did jump up like Barry said that it might like that? Uh, or typically does, okay. then how do you protect okay. it from basically being flushed in the gutter so you lose the Vibon back behind it? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously the wire position is real critical here. Right. Yep. Yeah, they're trying to deliver this celiac so that they're short of the splenic. Uh, so it, it is a little tricky. You've only got, you know, in a lot of cases, 10, 12, maybe 15 millimeters of purchase there. And, uh, you know, with the rest of it floating freely, it's probably a really good idea that they did elect to de deploy the C-tag first because it'll help to trap it. It won't go flying around. Got it. Uh, likewise in the SMA, you don't want to get too deep into that because of, uh, because of some of the early branches there. Okay, so guys on the panel, what we're going to do now, we've got the two graphs in position. They're a little, almost half and half, half in the celiac, half down below to the upper ostium of the left renal. And what we're going to do now is put in a, uh, a bare stent. Uh, just to make sure that we reinforce this over the one area and also uh, provide us some uh, opportunities to see this a little more conspicuously, the Viabon, because the next step we're going to do is, uh, is a, a little controversial, maybe. I mean, I hope it's, uh, we'll see what we think, but we're going to actually now going to try, after we get this uh, Omni in, we're going to go ahead and... Uh, use an aptus device, the helix, to try and cut down these gutters. First, we're going to mold with a coat of balloon in the uh, C tag. And the, once the uh, OmniLink uh, stent from Abbott is deployed, the OmniLink, OmniLink Elite, we're going to go ahead and uh, leave the balloon up. And then with biplane, get on either sides and tuck in the uh, excess fabric around our periscope to try and mitigate against any gutter leak coming retrograde. It's, uh, Mike, you're planning to build up with a second device ultimately, or um, we never saw yes. the top end? Yes. yes. Approximately. Yes. We're going we're gonna to have to build, Barry, with this 40 millimeter device to go to the top, we're going to be using a 45 at the top. 
Because you look like you have very, very good wall contact. You can see where it flowered out in the central part of the graft or the proximal part of the graft out. Um, are you going to document yeah. whether you have a leak first or just proceed with anchors? I think we're going to just proceed with anchors. Uh, take that down. We, can, we can do a run here if you'd like and take a look. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we just got to get our... Uh, our uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking how you're thinking about it because uh, uh, only for interest. You don't have to do anything you weren't planning to do. Um, but, no, no, uh, I think it's no, a I good it's, point. Yeah. It's fun for all of us to see. I'm just a little conscious of the Actually, time. If and we the, can, if we, we would, um, go ahead. One, uh, why don't you go back to the PowerPoint? Uh, the final slide is, because I knew somebody was going to ask this. So this is, a, this is a periscope we did about two uh, years ago. And this is the same thing. It's a celiac periscope. And so when we, uh, when we were looking at this one in follow-up, uh, thought that perhaps if we could find the area to tack in the um, thoracic device to, uh, to sort of close off the gutters, then we thought that that would be a, a, a reasonable approach. Because this, this, uh, this patient here, um, uh, the one on the slide, uh, wound up developing a, a distal type 1B that we later had to actually extend the periscope and bring down, uh, bring down an additional uh, branch. So Barry, as you well know, and others on the panel, Joe and others, this since we don't have access to all of the branch technologies that we might like to have, we're not one of the more fortunate sites to have that, we uh, got involved in this, quite honestly, uh, with experience with ruptured, ruptured thoracoabdominals, and how we could use existing technologies that we have off the shelf in these acute or emergent situations to deal with uh, rupture. That's how we got started and then we've sort of worked through and it's been very iterative. We've tried a number of different things. We get on, on to things that we kind of like doing and we think that are effective and then we build from there. So uh, in this particular case we've done a lot of branches and gutters uh, using again off-the-shelf technologies and we like branches in certain configurations but gutters we're still not sure that what you know, when gutters on chimneys and periscopes, we're still not really sure about that. Uh, we really get nervous if we have to put more than, than two parallel graphs in. And even sometimes with one, we end up with a gutter that we have to go down and try and catheterize and embolize with either a, a liquid embolic and or plugs and, and, uh, and coils. So Mike, this would be a simultaneous so, uh, inflation with the... a good question. We're going up with the Sorry, Jim, go ahead. I just, uh, you're, you're doing what we su suggest, suspected you would, which is you've got the balloon up in your mesenteric conduit at the same time that you're dilating the aorta. Yeah, we have to protect that because obviously we've, we don't want to crush it. Uh, as the balloons come down, we'll just do it in reverse. The big balloon comes down first. The little balloon comes down second. Uh, and then, as Barry said, we may do a run or we may go right. Again, we're having the biplane. We're really in good control in terms of placing these anchors if we choose to do so. Because obviously, as you can imagine, as long as we're 90 degrees, I can see the anchor go through in this uh, A plane. And in the B plane, I can make sure that I'm really on either side of it where I want to be. And again, where we want to be is at that overlap zone with the uh, parallel Here. periscope. Okay, come back. So okay. really, it's, it's one or two anchors aside, no more. We'll go ahead and do a run just to show you, okay? Great. All right, great. If, if you don't have biplane, which most, most people probably will not be working in a biplane environment, um, you, you can set the II at those two orthogonal positions and move pretty quickly back and forth. But I think the point is you need to be able to see what you're doing in, in the two orthogonal uh, projections. Uh, apnea. I think with uh, you know the anchor data that we already have and the comfort level that you know people that use endostaples on a regular basis, this is a a smart strategy. I'm I'm actually in favor of a prophylactic approach to this rather than waiting for things to happen later. I think the key here is going to be to straddle that uh, that viabon well, and I think what we've seen is that as those anchors are applied, it does pull the wall and the fabric together. I think from there, just a little thrombosis, a little new intima will probably take care of the rest of the gutter for you. And we're not over any renal, right? Although it does look like you've got okay, a very so long segment run. of great wall contact there uh, in this particular case. Yeah, I, I, I think what we may do, and it's up to you guys, that we can do one of two things in the time remaining. 
we can put the top extension and go up and look at the arch, or we can put the staples down here. I don't, we can try and do both, but the point is on these runs, what it does confirm is we didn't cover the splenic or the hepatic, and we are cl certainly clear of the left renal, the right renal still filling, so everything's good. We're very happy with our positioning and results. Uh, obviously, we're right on top of the SMA, as you can see on the B plane. We're just going to let this loop so you guys can digest this. If you have any comments, shoot them to us, and we'll keep working here. Yeah, I would just, I would just do what you would normally do next, Mike. I think we'll audience will benefit from seeing well, either, either of those the, two. Let's put the aptus in, okay? We've, so we've uh, we'll had some experience in. with endo anchors, and you, you, we, we, we use it a pretty good amount, but, but uh, less frequently uh, uh, sort of prophylactically than, let's say, trying to take care of endo leaks as a primary uh, use. Um, what we have found is that if the wall separates from the endograft, um, once you actually see a visual separation, it's actually pretty hard to grab that back wall and get them to connect. It's been very tempting. We've tried it a bunch of times, okay. so that probably the, the approach you're taking right now is probably if you have a patient that's high risk for a type one that you think is, is high risk, it's better to do it uh, acutely rather than waiting until there's a problem. See, they're smartly so keeping that balloon in there this too. First. Okay, let's go ahead okay. and take our. So we're at, yeah, that's a good point, Jim. We're uh, we're actually going to blow up the balloon yep. so that we see what see to it. avoid Here, I got when it. we. Uh, that way, when so you staple the balloon, you'll know you hit it. Put the anchors. <laughs> right, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> that was the plan. We left the balloon in place. I may even go up a little higher. Now, this, uh, the aptus, this is a 90 sheath. We'll take the dilator out. And it comes, as you guys are familiar, with three arcs in terms of 22, 32, 42 millimeters. This is a 40 graph, so we're using the 32 millimeter arc, okay? And I think what we may also do, Jason, is uh, just to... How does this work? Is that why? Yeah. Oh, put the Hold dilator on, put, put back. The dilator. Yeah. It's just to, for the heck of it, let's take our pigtail out, and I'll go back to the back table, and you guys can... Uh, I, you know, for some in the audience, this may be interesting. This is the aptus uh, applicator. We put the sheath in. Now we've got the applicator, and we have the staples over here in this cartridge. Why don't we bring that over right here perfect and we'll just load them up and uh, oh it's already loaded okay well then we'll show them how we load the next one fine sorry <laughs> my bad okay so let's uh, go ahead and yep. of course it's already loaded you got a good staff there yeah so, absolutely so Jim, mike this may be a radiology situations? thing but what's going on with that kidney wires out wire out too i'm sorry what no, just a little joke. I was just asking what was going on with the kidney. The uh, collecting system there on that left side. Oh, yeah. Put a nephrostomy really in on the way out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we can we do a nephrostomy with an aptus here any second. Yeah. Drive, drive it's get, it's going to get in the way pretty soon. Yeah. So, Michael Jeff, um, these patients are followed Please frequently right with CT scans for follow-up but not at the same intervals that I might want to look at a renal or a mesenteric stent. Stent grafts are obviously a little bit different when you look at them with ultrasound. Does that pose challenges for well, maybe ultrasound I surveillance? Go a higher. Yeah, I think it's gained more uh, momentum, certainly at our place, with the volume of patients who struggle with the Why repeated like contrast that? administration, et cetera. We'll We've been doing more little and little more little endograft little. surveillance. It's not the easiest thing. It's a... Uh, sensitive like test, yeah, but maybe not the best. Yeah. But I think to look at really aneurysm sac size, completely. which can be an indirect marker, Oops. you know, a very yeah. high color I gain like look at an endo leak, I think we're okay at you like it. Like that? Yeah. yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Put All right. So you're getting ready to advance the on. first staple around? Well, we're going around, yeah. And in this view, obviously, we can see the. Go out, Jason. Yeah, you can see the conduit, but you can't really see the right angle of the okay. endostaple. Do you have the balloon inflated or no? Yeah, there we go. The balloon is yes, inflated balloons. and we're away from it there. Yeah. So the biplane is really helpful in this, in this situation. Yeah. Button, right? Because I, I personally would be reluctant in a single plane view to deploy the Not going. staple in that yeah. view. 
Okay. All right, so we do exactly what the video editor is doing, is showing us uh, each projection and, and move the C-arm. Okay. Uh, pull it out then. But it's a lot more cumbersome. But the radiation is significantly higher, obviously, with, with biplane as well. He's right here. Are there certain clinical situations in which prophylactic endostapling versus just watching and waiting and uh, looking at the gutters at some time down the road? Because many of these really won't form a gutter leak. Next time specific loaded, situations where there's back, more periscopes, you know, more branches, I think probably increase that risk. Do you, okay. do you have a threshold of when you want to do this up front versus doing it later? And yeah, most of the data that we would extrapolate from that anchor trial wasn't really looking at snorkels and chimneys and all these, all these other conduits. Okay. It was, but it was divided into treatment versus empiric. And uh, the, well, we the lost empiric the battery, group guys, really I had guess, uh, no migration not sure how and or very why, little, if any, uh, uh, type 1 endo leaks. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a bit of a leap we'll take a look. to no say problem. that it would do exactly we'll the same, but uh, you know, your alternative strategies are probably not very attractive either if you're trying to stuff some onyx or glue or something else like that into a, into a gutter like that. It'd be really hard to find. The use of these endo anchors for gutter leaks specifically is re relatively recent. Um, when you look at the registry data that occurred, there's several thousand patients. There was prophylactic use uh, in, in marginal necks and where people were worried about wall contact, short necks, angulation, and things like that. That's, that was the principal prophylactic. But this has probably been the last uh, 12 to 18 months. People have been looking at it for gutters and, and chimney grass specifically. So for those that haven't okay. used this device, so let's try uh, what, what you'll ultimately see is yeah, we'll try as it. a two-stage deployment, the first stage, the screw That's fires better. part okay, way and it's still right. retrievable. And the goal for the operator is you want to have this 90 degree angle. You'll see the staple actually almost like a, uh, okay, now an upholstery screw there, Jason, gonna extend gonna through the graft and into the, uh, into the wall. Once you're sure that, that that has occurred, then you're free to fire the remainder of the uh, staple. If you don't like your position, you can withdraw it. And wait, wait, in a case like this, that. even more important, uh, you know, when on those rare events these yeah, like staples that. don't okay, seat and they go elsewhere. Just wait one more second. Uh, they have a tendency to go into renal and mesenteric vessels, and then you're, okay, you're dealing with ahead. a fairly tough uh, okay. snare type of a procedure. Little forward pressure. You'll see he'll generally, he's putting forward pressure on that, and then you'll push in a little bit and you push the sheath back to confirm you're in wall contact. It's not. Yeah, and probably good to point out that there's a limit to how much you want to do that because that. You get too much separation between nope. the tip of the endostaple applicator yeah, and the in. supportive sheath. It can almost it flop sideways, and then you're um, going to deliver the screw in a more of a tangential well, plane. Put our top in, okay? What's the immediate complication rate as far as the depth of stapling? Is yeah. there an issue there? That, Zero. Yeah. Zero. It's not working, Matt. Okay. We'll, do, well, we're having a little uh, throw swings and misses here. So what we're going to do, and let's bring this down, this balloon down. Okay. All right. Well, the, is the angle too uh, severe? No, it just, okay. Back it up. No, it's not. Okay, one more time. Here we go. So, Mike, is it, is it not rotating? Because uh, we can't hear the sound or anything. Was it, was the uh, screw not rotating or no, not the, advancing uh, or? The, no, the light, there was some not, there's some light thing that wasn't coming. We were I think not, it was a battery issue. Just hang on. It may, uh, I got to get back in position here. So just wait one second, guys. Yeah, turning it on out of the box is uh, okay. Try that. Important stuff. Okay. Right there, I like that. Good yeah. position. Okay. Go. Oh, I hear. Yeah, there we go. All right, so you can yeah. see the staple is extended. They'll complete that. Yeah. Can you? Fine. You okay, can see good. it really well, Mike. Good. You can take it Floral. out. Okay. No, no, huh? just take it out. Uh huh. Floral. Yeah. Okay, guys. Let's. Why don't you make? Oh, you, oh you took it out. Put, put, push it back. No. Put it out and then pull the thing back. Oh. That's maybe. Yeah, so the second okay, uh, second advancement is the one that'll release it. How did that come Floral? back if he pushed it all away? Floral? It should be released. There it goes. Yeah, it's okay, released. Okay, let's have another one. So Not next they'll just straighten out that guide delivery system yep. and, and rotate yep, yep. it a little bit. I. Personally, you know, without biplane, I'll usually put it in a 90-degree angle and then just move my eye-eye and then reposition the, the, the 
delivery uh, guide back to its 90 degree I'm position. I'm going to go to the other kind of side now. The array that they're uh, that they're delivered in. It's still recoverable at this point. Yeah. So they've delivered the first. Uh, they're going to get this catheter in a proper position for a second. Which looks great. I'm on the great. other side of the balloon now, allegedly. Don't want to go I'm on the other lower. side of the balloon now. Almost sounds like we're talking to a lunar mission here. Okay. Okay. You like that? Flip, forward, Flip over to the other biplane yeah. view. Here it goes. Nope. Bring it back. No good. So you saw how that kind of skated north. Mike probably needs to get a little more bend in that catheter so it goes more at a perpendicular. You also have to hit it between the uh, the metallic uh, frame. You know, sometimes yeah. you'll you're not quite exactly on the fabric. I like that one. That was absolutely spot on. I'll, you can look. That's what I wanted to first see. We're right at where the gutter. We don't want the gutter. We're right next to the device, next to the balloon and straight on. Okay, so that's a winner. I think we'll try one more and let's go back to the other side of that. Go back to the other side and then we'll try and put our top in and we'll sh show you a, 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 a completion here. All right. You've got almost 11 minutes, Mike, so just take your time. Okay. Hey, Mike, I was just talking to Barry about his choice of stents uh, for your periscope. It seems like he differs from my technique and we both differ from your technique. Could you expa explain a little bit why you choose a Viabon with a balloon expandable stent as opposed to just a balloon expandable stent like an atrium? Uh, yeah, again, it's just a matter of we've tried all of these different things, Joe. Let me, let me just, I, why don't you talk, uh, Jason, I'm going to get this in yeah, position. The ones, um, we'll use an eye cast if we think it's a straight downward going vessel when we're coming from above. For the periscopes, because it essentially has to make a U-turn or have at least a right angle turn, I think the self-expanding uh, patent, or the, the patency of a, of a covered self-expanding is better. In terms of lining it again, I think to add some additional radial force wherever it's touching the main body endograft, uh, that's, that's been our strategy to endo line uh, the periscopes. But there are multiple different ways, and if you look at the literature, people have had equivalent patency rates for self-expanding versus blowing expandable covered sense. Barry, do you think it matters uh, patency-wise when you take a Vibon and you put a balloon expandable inside of it? Or do, do you think the body of the graft just behaves well anyway? Uh, I think I think probably we would support the Viabon with this degree of angulation, with the CLA going down for sure. I think the question Joe is asking is support it with a self-expanding versus a balloon expandable stent. Is that okay. what you're saying? Probably okay. we just put a self-expanding stent uh, in it. Let's go ahead and pull it out, Jason. Principally driven by flexibility needs. Yeah. yeah. So, so guys, can you see where we are? Let's put this. Balloon. We see, Mike. I don't want those. So that's, I'm happy, I'm, on, I'm close to each side of the balloon, right at where the gutter is. It's not sort of, you know, uh, too, too high up, not too low down. I think we're gonna stop there and now we're gonna go up and take the top end, okay? Fluoro. So right. I will fluoro and let's go ahead and take this out. So there's not necessarily a magic recipe to the number of staples that one has to place. In, guys, I think in a perfect world, Mike might have put another one or two in just, uh, just to line that kind of equidistantly up and down. But for the uh, purposes of this demonstration, I think we'll all be happy to see the second graft go in. One other technique we've used when we're trying to, like if we have a short and a calcified neck, you can use cone beam CT so during do. these cases and actually uh, see where the, uh, in, in real time, where the uh, um, endo anchors are in relationship to the graft and the wall of the artery. Uh, we don't do it very much, but if, you're, you know, it'll sometimes save a repeat procedure. Here's the pigtail that's going to go off. There you go. So, Barry, while they're working here, uh, and Jim, what's going to happen is we're just going to get the wire up. Uh, get a pigtail up into the uh, ascending, do the run. We're going to use a 45 by 20 uh, C tag at the left carotid and then uh, go uh, down and overlap with our current 40 by 20. But I want to show you something 
uh, while they're working that I, I hope you'll find interesting. Can I have another set of gloves, guys? Uh, one of the things that's been talked about and that uh, others have taken advantage of, like Gustavo Oderich and others, is, is doing some models of these. And I, we had a patient we were going to show you today, but because of uh, some issues with his medical care and, and also his schedule and calendar, he can't be with us today. But we had a, a model made for his uh, case. And I want to just show you how these models have actually helped inform us, yeah, inform us about our cases. And again, when we get to the next case, which is uh, involving a lot of octopus parallel graphs, uh, we've gone through a learning process of what we've now found to be our sort of dominant strategy, and these models have, have helped us a lot. So uh, I'm going to just show you this model. This is an actually a Got me? A one-to-one, -one, uh, there we go, one-to-one -one, uh, scale model to this patient that we were going to show you today. And as you can see, there's a stent in here. This is obviously stereolithography done with a photoacrylic. And then this is a photoreactive dye. And obviously, uh, you guys are familiar with stereolithography, but it uses uh, obviously a resin, a polyacrylic resin that laser etched uh, this model. And how this has helped us, and then I'm going to just show you, is that we, had, we couldn't finish this case. We got uh, one, come can back. you come tight, guys, in here? It's on the other camera. Come back. Tight? Yeah. Tight? Tighter? Closer? Mag? Zoom. There you there go. There you go. Keep coming. Zoom. Okay, I'll come to you then. Okay. <laughs> so here we see this, and you can see a branch, gra a branch graft here, and this other branch graft coming by here. So that's the SMA and the left yeah, renal. We could never get in the right renal. Uh, it was a problem. And this really has informed us about how our sequences work in the multitude of steps that come when you're doing multiple branches. As you can see, this model nicely shows that the left renal branch is directly on top and laying over the right renal ostium. Now, this is good for a lot of things besides just, uh, you know, showing patients their anatomy and, and showing the staff ways that we can, uh, how we want to work and do things. But it actually, this particular model helped us understand that we really can't do it this way. We've got to make sure that all graphs are in position. And of course, this was done uh, some time ago, and, and uh, uh, we were going to finish him off today and show you how we were going to deal with this challenge. But uh, th this is done by Symbionics. Uh, as you may know, Symbionics was acquired by 3D Systems, 3D Systems in Israel. But this model was actually made in Golden, Colorado. And uh, Symbionics and 3D Systems have a way now just to take a data set, get it into a 3D model, and then get it sent off to printing. They use a Pro 800. X printer for stereolithography, and just thought I'd show it to you. And uh, I know uh, others have used this technique to really help inform them, and it's been very educational for us to uh, use this and really understand more about how to do multi branch devices. So now we're, we've got our uh, pigtail in location. We'll go back to Jason, and here is the arch run. Okay, breathe. Go ahead, Jason. You take it. I'm going to get re-gloved okay. here. So you see, um, if we slow it down, breathe. We see the, uh, the origin of that uh, left carotid. Uh, overlaying it is the origin of the uh, subclavian. And there's, a, there's an Amplatzer 1 uh, that's in the subclavian uh, proximal to the uh, takeoff of the vert. So that's a nice view uh, there of where we need to be. Okay. Got it. All right, thanks. Let's have uh, Okay, so we're going to try and put this in, and then I know you guys are going on to right. lectures, but I'm sure we'll be streaming if people want to see the conclusion, but we're coming down the home stretch here. So we've got about 90 seconds, Mike. Um, I'm assuming you'll leave that pigtail okay, well, we'll in place. Okay, we'll try and get this in position for you. Uh, you see it? You can see, obviously, the top of the first piece, which was 40 by That's 20. So this is the right length. We'll have enough overlap. It'll be generous enough. And we'll try and put this, again, we're not going to get too jiggy with our left carotid for many of the reasons you talked about earlier. But we'll get close to the left carotid. This is about a 30, 
Uh, what do we got? 30, 40 degrees. Yeah. yeah. Maybe need a little less, but we'll uh, we'll see. It kind of in that position. Huh? We yeah. So you want at least uh, three centimeters of overlap in these two graphs? Is that a fair statement? Well, I think the fair think, statement is you want as much overlap right? as you can get, Jim. Isn't that the same? More the more the better, really. Sure. Unless there's some weird angulation, you might run into trouble. But I think you need a minimum of three is probably right. Okay, how are we doing, guys? So this is a 45 by 20, is that correct? Yeah. This is 45 by 20. All right, so you're about 15 from you your or the other? left common carotid to the top of the previously placed graph, so that should be plenty. I think you drew in the supply bin. Ryan. Are you okay, Ryan? I just can't see the I think 40 may be a skosh too much, but are you device. okay? Yeah. Okay. Good. Device on. So here comes the device. We'll get it in there and do it and then try and get a quick pigtail up there. Okay. How are we doing? We're going to show them the last run. Just hit the minus button on that, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. I got it. Mike, we're a little over, but we're going to stay with you for a couple minutes. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. It's all right. Here we go. You see it, Ryan? The thing that you drew earlier was the subclavian. Slow it down, Mike. I'm saying this goes As the carotid. Okay. Yeah, we'd, we'd rather see this yeah. streaming than have you uh, make that okay. subclavian that, Mike? carotid yeah, bypass and no longer use it. I definitely things. do. That's absolutely correct. Okay, yeah, here we go. And again, having that. This is a fairly large aneurysm. There's a lot of mural thrombus, but having that first piece in there should help stabilize this a little, especially when you have a big aneurysmal sac, proximal descending, distal arch, the gore graft de deploying from the mid to the both ends. If there's a big, you know, capacious sac, we may look for this to come down just a little, but this should help stabilize us here, and I think will be uh, pretty accurate. And again, you, you can point out the gold band, Jim, and the fact, you like that? Yeah. Okay, the fact that the, uh, the first part proximal to the gold band are uncovered apices. That looks very nice. Right on. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead quickly, and can we have our pigtail, and are we hooked up ready, guys? Almost. Yeah, so what Mike okay, was saying is that, do, Jim, that gold band that's at the central part of the stent graft is a demarcation between where the graft material begins and open, open ends. That can sometimes be used to your advantage when you're uh, placing these close to some of the head and neck wash vessels. That, wash that. Jason, uh, is this so, a case where you would, would uh, ultimately dilate or do you not dilate these? Uh, maybe over the, um, the overlap portion of the two pieces, but I think proximally, just because the neck wasn't that great, I think if you start ballooning, it'll shift unpredictably. Yeah. So if there's no endo leak or gaping endo leak proximally, then we're going to leave it. Well, clearly we'll take a look. We've taken care of the lower. This is slightly has that added degree of complexity with the periscope, but we would use a trilobe balloon typically over the overlap position. Uh, but, you know, if we don't see a leak, on this completion angio, we tend not to go gratuitously ballooning, especially up in the arch. All right, Mike, I'm going to get everybody's hands warmed up for the round of applause that you're about to receive. Um, Forward on the Just to, Forward on for the formalities, we want to thank you and Jason and your team for a great case. This is a, this is a Herculean case to do in a short period of time, and you've, uh, you've handled it beautifully. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much, Jim. Let's go ahead and uh, floral just quickly, and I'll reposition this a bit so we see. There we go. Okay. Are you ready, Kim? 20 for 30, same. And just for the audience's sake, we will be continuing to stream this online so you can see whatever final tweaks are done to this case. Okay, ventilate. Looks pretty good. Well, we got a little, that's not the pretty, pretty image that we were hoping for. We may have to, but we can, I think, I we think can see that we're not. Positioning's good. You may need to do a little bit of trilobe dilation, but um, 
I think you hit it right on the mark. Okay, we'll show you a better final, but we'll we'll try to tweak this a little and let you guys go ahead with we'll see you at the next case, okay? All right, Mike. Nice job. Thanks. Over the hey Ryan, we drew the Supplavian in. Can we, can we turn off the mic from them? We're over. We're 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 uh, we're distal to the Supplavian. Still bleeding when we did that. I mean, breathing when we did that run. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to. We'll have to wait longer. But it's a lot what, of bad. What obliquity for the carotid did 30, we want? Thirty. Thirty. So let's 30, go to thirty. Thirty-five. Okay. Uh, can we reset the injector, please? Yeah, that's that. We're, uh, uh, we're 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 not even over the subclavian. No, we're not. Okay. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to thirty on this thing. Thirty of LAO. Let's just focus on that part now, then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can we get the? Uh, let's just get this at 30 degrees yeah. A plane, and then we'll go ahead and take a look. 30. 30. 30. Good. Yeah. 30. Perfect. 27. Go back, go back to 30. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. Let's get ready to mark again. Can, can you floor? Let's just. Is that okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, there's we're the not plug. Yeah, the right plug there. is we're there. Not even close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Looks like nice. we. Uh, okay. No, it's I'm, okay. Uh, Jason. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go next door. Yeah. Or you go, I'll go next door. Okay. Let's do um, 20 for 30 again. Let's have another device open. And Jason. Yeah. Make sure you take a look at the box. Yeah. Okay? But we got an hour for yeah. the next. Three yeah. Remember, you keep your headset set. Yeah. Off yeah. Off. Let's open up a 45 by. Uh, what should we put there? A 10. Yeah. Okay, are we armed? Can we have a breath hold, please? Yeah, there's the carotid way back there, Ryan. Breathe. Okay, let's have a 45 by 10 open. It was that early thing was the carotid. The thing you drew in was the subclavian, which is, that's what I was kind of, yeah, there's the edge of the carotid. It's that one. Yes. Because then that's the carotid subclavian. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. You see it now? Yes. Kim, this is the final completion of the arch. We added, uh, Jason added a uh, 45 by 10, more proximal, so we really could fine tune and, and I think precisely hit on that uh, distal carotid osteum, and that looks good. And then why don't we go to the next run, Kim? And we, she had. She, the next run in the abdomen? There we, there go. we go. So this is down below, and you can see uh, we're filling both renals. You can see the celiac branches, hepatic, and Splenic are filling late through the uh, periscope, and the SMA is obviously filling. You can sort of, we'll give you a few loops to see all those branches filling. And we're right down with the uh, distal C tag right on the SMA osteum. So all in all, we're pretty happy with that. And now we're going to go to the slides for this case.